Hello, I am Gabriel, lead pastor of Grace Communion Richardson, and I just want to welcome you to this Sunday's live stream of our worship. Here at Grace Communion Richardson, we seek to know Jesus and to make him known through worship, family fellowship, and neighborhood engagements. And we do all of that out of the compelling love of Jesus Christ. Please let us know where you are watching from and who you are watching with. We, we just love to know that. And also, please feel free to send us your prayer request. Uh, we know that there are a whole lot of things going on in our nation and around the world. Uh, some communal, some national, but of course there are also very personal things, uh, challenging things uh, that people are going through at this time. So please send us your prayer request if you have any prayer request, and you can send them to uh, the address at the bottom right corner of your screen. And I promise that we will pray with you and for you. I know that it is Father's Day today, by the way, and uh, I just want to uh, say thank you to all the fathers, granddaddies, and father figures uh, that we have in our lives. I will say a little bit more about fatherhood in a short while. I know that a lot of us miss in-person worship. and There are a lot of churches that are getting ready to go back to in-person worship if they've not already done so. We are in the process of planning to go back to in-person worship. Uh, we want to do it in a safe and secure manner, comfortable as much as possible for all. And at the same time, we want to also continue to be online even when we do go back to in-person uh, worship. Now, as soon as the decision is made, uh, we will let you know. Uh, in the meantime, please continue to join us in prayer as we prepare to uh, go back to in-person worship and to do it in a safe way uh, in a secure and comfortable way, and at the same time also uh, serve those who for a variety of reasons may not be able to be with us in person when we do go back to in-person worship. At this time, I would like to uh, jo uh, invite you to join our praise team as they share a praise song, and then we are going to have uh, prayer and scripture reading uh, by Bruce and Debbie and then after that I will come back and say heartfelt thanks to all of you especially those of you uh, who've been very supportive uh, financially uh, in our ministry and then we'll go to the main uh, message uh, today so please stay with us we'll be right back good afternoon happy Father's Day in Psalm 92, 1, it says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to the Most High, for He is worthy. Amen. Oh, mm -hmm. 
Let us pray. Almighty God and Creator, we come before you this morning just gathered as your people around this city, this country, and in many nations, Father. We thank you for this technology that even though we aren't able to gather in person, we can still gather as your children to receive your message from your servant, our pastor, and that we can take this information, Father, this knowledge that he's sharing with us and grow closer to you through it. And we pray that you'll help it to touch our hearts, Father, as we grow closer to you. We just thank you for the opportunities that you give us to um, love you and to share our lives with those around us, Father. Help us to be the light of your way of life to those we come in contact with. And Father, we want to pray for this whole nation and for the whole world that's suffering under this virus, that you will come down and make a difference and, and take this and use it for your glory. And we pray for our nation who's undergoing many different divisions right now. We need to be unified. We don't need to be torn apart. Help each one of us to work towards unity in this nation, Lord. And we thank you for this opportunity to be here. We pray for your blessing on our pastor as he speaks and, and uh, the worship and everything that goes on here today. And we put all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Genesis 21, 8 through 21. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. Well, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Don't be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders, then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered into the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of the God came to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw the well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert, and he became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Matthew 10, 24-33 The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers, and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim, proclaim from the roof. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worthy more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. 
But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Well, thank you very much to Debbie and Bruce and also to our praise uh, worship team uh, for sharing with us. Uh, I want to say thank you also to all of you Grace Communion Richardson members, uh, supporters, and others of you who share our values uh, for your generosity, for your lifestyle of generosity, and for supporting uh, the church and the gospel effort uh, of Grace Communion Richardson. Uh, those of you who want to uh, support this uh, effort, want to join in this effort, uh, you can see some of the ways that you can do so on the screen some of the ways that you can donate. And I just want to say a heartfelt thank you for your tax-deductible donations. Thank you. Today is Father's Day, and I want to acknowledge how important fathers and father figures are in the family and in our society. I did not grow up with a father in the house most of the time. I grew up in a single mother home. But I had some father figures in my life who were very helpful to me. As I stand here, I can, you know, immediately recall uh, a couple of them uh, that were very, very helpful to me. Uh, one that comes to mind is Latif. I know he's going to leave uh, his last name out, but he was very helpful to me growing up uh, as a teenager without a father in the home. And I know that not only are fathers important, but so are grandfathers and so are all the other father figures uh, that we have. One of our greatest challenges in the black community is a lack of fathers and father figures uh, in the home. And it is a very, very big challenge uh, that we need to tackle. There is a saying that it is not what you are called, but what you answer to that matters. And one of the roles, important roles of fathers is to help children to know what and how to answer a call. What call to answer to and how to answer to that call. Fathers teach and help children to know which call to answer to and how. And one of the calls the fathers are to help children answer is God's call. God calls all of us and our role as fathers is to help our children, both boys and girls, to know how to answer God's call so that they can become all that God created and intended them to become. So here is a video in honor of fathers and father figures. And as the video plays, I want to join my voice in thanksgiving. Thank you, fathers and all father figures. Thank you for your dedication and for staying true to your calling in Jesus as stewards of children, precious in God's sight as you point children to him. Thank you very much, and we will see you in a short while after the video.
want to invite you to a Zoom discussion after this message. The ID is on the screen. Uh, if you need to, to call using the phone, the phone number is on your screen as well. If you are watching on Facebook, the link that you can click on to join Zoom is in the description. If you are watching from our website, the link is on top of the video. I look forward to, to meeting you uh, on Zoom for discussion and for fellowship. God bless. Well, welcome back to the main uh, message for today. When we put our fate, our lives, into the Lord's hands, cast our lot with Jesus, we are never alone. As we accept our identity in Him and commit to follow Him, He never leaves nor forsake us. He never abandons us, even when we make bad choices and decisions. That's how much He loves us. That's how much God values us. That's how much He's placed worth on each and every one of us. Remember, you are never alone. And today we want to look at the story of Hagar and Ishmael to remind us and encourage us of this truth. And I thank uh, Bruce and Debbie for sharing the scripture uh, in Genesis 21 and verses 8 to 20. Genesis 21 verses 8 to 21. Last week we concluded uh, the story in Genesis uh, about Sarah and Abraham uh, being promised a child. And we concluded reading that narrative that indeed God's promises are sure because God is faithful. And Abraham and I, I, um, Sarah were given the gift of a son, Isaac. The promised birth of Isaac came to pass. Now, we continue the story from there in Genesis chapter 21 and verses 1 uh, verse 8 actually Genesis 21 uh, verse 8 and I'm not going to uh, read all of it I'm going to read except of this in verse 8 the 21st chapter of Genesis we read that the child that is Isaac grew and was weaned and on the day Isaac was weaned Abraham held a great feast but Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham was mocking. And he said to Abraham, that is Sarah, speaking to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. So this is the story as we continue so isaac has been born and isaac has gone you know reached age two or three uh, which is when usually in that part of the world and at that time children are weaned and to be weaned simply means your mother stops breastfeeding you right you can now begin to uh, eat other meals and you're no longer relying on your mother's uh, breastfeeding. So Isaac is being weaned and Abraham throws a party as is usually again the case uh, in those days and in that part of the world. Through a party, a weaning party. You know in our time different cultures have different parties. Uh, the Jews have uh, bar mitzvah and and um, you know some Hispanic cultures have uh, quinceanera and so on uh, and so it is a winning party that uh, Abraham threw for Isaac but if you did not know before Isaac was born Sarah had convinced Abraham to have a baby with Hagar Hagar was Sarah's house help Hagar was Sarah's house help and Sarah convinced Abraham her husband 
to have a baby with Hagar so that God's promise of Abraham being a father of many nations will come to pass because they were getting tired of waiting for that promise to occur. So 14 years earlier, because at this time, that baby had grown up to be a teenager and at the age of 14, his name was Ishmael. So this is the context of the story. During this winning party for Isaac, 14-year-old Ishmael was mocking the whole event and mocking uh, Isaac, presumably. Uh, scriptures do not go into details as to what he did or said that constituted that mocking. But Sarah was not a happy camper when she saw what Isaac was saying or doing or both. Right, so this is this is the story, and she went to Abraham and said, "Look, kick this, kick my house help and her son out. After all, we don't need them any longer. I'm I'm editorializing here. We don't need them any longer. We now have Isaac, and he is going to be the standard bearer for the inheritance that God has promised through you." So Abraham, just as he accepted, acquiesced to the idea of having a child with Hagar, accepted and acquiesced to this uh, demand from Sarah as well. In fact, God said, yeah, Sarah is right. Um, the inheritance that I have promised does not go through Ishmael, it goes through Isaac. Isaac is the child of promise. So, Abraham acquiesced to the decision to throw out Hagar and Ishmael from the household. You know, we see here very human uh, actions and reactions playing out. We human beings, we are subject to jealousies, we are subject to feelings of anger, we are subject to uh, disproportionate responses to things that happen to us. And we've seen some of it in these past few weeks with what's been going on around us uh, with issues of race and injustice. Sometimes we react disproportionately to each other. And you look back and it, you wonder what sense did it make to react in that manner. So we see here, you know, it, it's some examples of disproportionate responses taking place. So. Bad decisions all around, as we can see in this narrative. And you go down to verse 11, Genesis chapter 21, and in verse, we continue from verses 11 through 14. Genesis 21, verses 11 through 14. As soon as I can get there, I can start reading it. Uh, we see that. Abraham threw out Hagar and Ishmael. So verse 11. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. Now, Ishmael was Abraham's son too, just as Isaac. Albeit different mothers, but same father. And um, we've seen the result of this narrative, this story, play out over the years with the Arabs who is uh, the uh, Ishmael is the progenitor the the father of the Arabs and of course Isaac uh, the father of the Jews and and the and the and the consequence of of this family uh, story has been playing out for many centuries now Verse 12, but God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of this slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. And so early the next morning, Abraham took food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on his shoulders and sent and then sent her off with a boy. She went on her way and wandered 
in the desert of Beersheba. So this is where we we find Hagar and Ishmael in the desert. Just the two of them with just enough food. Again, you see here that decisions are being made that are not really very wise. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we understand that Ishmael is not going to be the child through whom the inheritance promised Abraham was going to be fulfilled. What stopped Abraham, even, if, even as that was true, what stopped him from making provision for Hagar and Ishmael beyond just enough food for them to wander in the desert? Remember, Abraham was a well-to-do person. And when I read this story, I wonder sometimes, why didn't Abraham send Hagar and Ishmael to some place where they can be properly taken care of? Why just cast them out and abandon them in the desert? It's, it just reads so cruel when you read this story. And it, it, it smacks of very bad judgment, very bad decision on the part of Abraham. Sure. We read that he was distressed about the situation. And I would have thought that that distress will make him pause and think through how he can take care of his son and the mother of his son in a way that will not endanger and threaten their lives as this particular decision that he made did. But again, this shows how human we are. And this same Abraham is called the father of the faithful. It shows not only how human we are, friends, but also how merciful and gracious God is with us. God is very gracious and He does not hold our bad choices and bad decisions against us. A lot of times we make bad choices and bad decisions and God does not hold them against us. Because he's faithful to himself. He cannot change who he is in terms of his nature, his love, his compassion, his graciousness, his mercy, his forgiveness. And so he doesn't hold these bad decisions that we are reading about against any of the players involved. He actually steps in. So we read that Hagar and Isaac are now left all by themselves in the desert. Very little food, very little water, and soon they run out of water. And we read that from verses 15 to 21. They run out of water and then God steps in. Verse 15. When the water in the skin was gone, Hagar put the boy under one of the bushes. Again, here's a 14-year-old teenager. Then she went off and sat down about a, a, a bow shot away. For she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob, began to cry, racked with sobbing. Verse 17, God heard the boy crying. So I, uh, Ishmael was also crying. They were thirsty. They were hungry. It was hot in the desert. You know, it's getting hot now in Texas. We are in, you know, in summer. And, and God, thank God for air conditioning. They didn't have that in those days. And they were scared, frightened. Verse 17, God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened Hagar's eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. Let's read that again. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. 
There's an interesting story here. So, Hagar and Ishmael all alone, run out of water, run out of, uh, uh, very thirsty, scared, didn't know what was going to happen next. Well, in fact, they thought they knew what was going to happen next, and that was that they were going to die uh, all alone in the desert. And then God reveals the truth, a truth that is also true for you and for me, and that is that God is present with us. God was present with Ishmael and with Hagar in their most in their greatest need when they thought they were all alone. God revealed himself to be present uh, with them, that they were not alone. God steps in and provides, looking out for the well-being of Hagar and Ishmael. God in Jesus does the same for us. He steps into our dire straits, into our shadow of death and rescues, redeems, reconciles, provides. And he more often than not changes the trajectory of our stories. The trajectory of Ishmael and Hagar's story, if you just went with it alongside with them, you would think it was going to end in what? In death. Because they ran out of water. They didn't have any sustenance. And yet God changed that trajectory from possible death to life. From certain death, I mean, to life. He changed that trajectory. And God changes the, tra the trajectory of our stories as well because He is present with us in them. He provided for Hagar and Ishmael just as He provides for us. And God does not always step in at the point that we want, at the point that we desire, at the point that we crave. He steps in at his time and at his point. And I personally believe his time and his point is always the best for us. And he did the same here. And I think that sometimes when God does that, the power of it is imprinted better in our hearts and our minds. Uh, we come to realize how futile our own ideas and our own ways are. When we run with it for a while and we come to the, re the end of our rope and he steps in and says, okay, I'm taking over here and I'm going to change the trajectory of your life. I'm going to make it better than you thought it could ever be. And that is what happened with Ishmael and Hagar. God was with Ishmael throughout, not just part of the time. And as the scripture tells us, he became a great nation, just as God promised. And we see the Arabs, uh, some of the richest nations on the face of this earth even today. We have a lot of thirsty places in our lives right now. We face death's shadow right now from the virus and from other situations as human beings. We face other perilous situations and God knows, God is with us. We are never alone. If you forget anything and everything I say today in this message, that's the one line I don't want you to forget. And that is, you are never alone. God is always with us. And we see this affirmation in Matthew chapter 10. Again, thank you to uh, Debbie and Bruce for sharing that. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus himself affirms this truth that God is with us and that God never abandons us and that God has placed his love and as a result his value uh, on us. So we are worthy in his sight because of his love, right? He is 
interested in us. He is desirous of us. He wants us, he likes us, he loves us, and he wants us to share his life with him. Matthew, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 27, uh, verses 27 to 33, I am going to read excerpts of that. Matthew chapter 27. Jesus speaking here says, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What I what is whispered, what is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Jesus is basically saying that we are better off, in fact, we are best off having him as a frame of reference in our lives. Excuse me. He is the one who protects and who provides because he's placed his love and value and worth on us. He's aware of everything that's going on in his world, in his creation. He's aware when a sparrow, when a bird falls to the ground, he says. And he says, how much more? human beings that he has created in his own image and in his likeness. He says he's aware of us. He's intimately aware of what our situations are, what our needs are, what our dreams are, what our hopes are, what our fears and anxieties are. He says the number, the hairs on our head are known to him. <clears throat> That's how much intimate, intimately aware and involved that God is with each and every one of us. He affirms our value before God. That's what here, Matthew 10, 27 to 33, Jesus is doing. He's affirming that you are valuable to God. No matter who you are and what you think of yourself, no matter what your background, you are valuable to God, Jesus says. He puts it in a rather, you know, on an understated term. So are you not more valuable than two sparrows, <laughs> right? Two a couple of birds. We are more valuable than that. And he encourages us not to give up in the face of challenges and opposition. We should not allow the situation, the circumstances, the challenges that we face in this world make us forget that he should be the frame of reference. We should not allow these challenges that we are facing even now, whether it's a virus or the, the, the need for us to understand each other better in all the ways that we should, uh, not only racially, but also in terms of the various differences that we have that he has created and has given us as a gift. He said, we shouldn't allow these challenges that we go through in life to make us forget who He is and how He is in our lives. He says, we should continue to acknowledge Him even in the depths of our challenges, even in the depths of our trauma, even in the depths of our disappointments and betrayals, even in the depths of situations that seem beyond us. He says, 
we should not we should not write him off we should not disown him in that sense we should remember that he is in it with us and that he is faithful that he will never leave nor forsake us and out of this understanding we can be bold in facing this life we can be courageous in facing this life in reaching for truth in reaching for love in reaching for compassion in our relationship with each other in reaching for reconciliation in our relationships with each other we can be bold in that we can be courageous in that have you noticed that people who actually make positive changes in this world especially people of faith they do so with uncommon courage and boldness because they recognize that they are secure and safe in the hands of the Lord who has promised never to leave them or to forsake them. And that same promise is to you and to me. I want to conclude with Hebrews chapter 13 and in verse 6. Hebrews chapter 13 and in verse 6, uh, the writer of Hebrews actually comes out and plainly says that God in Jesus never leaves, never abandons, never forsakes us. Hebrews the 13th chapter and in verse 5 it says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. When he talks about the love of money here, he's saying money should not be the source of our sense of security. Money does not provide that sense of security that you think it will. It shouldn't be the source of our sense of safety, right? Because, he said, the writer says, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say, verse 6, with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? That's beautiful. I hope we can all, in the depths of our challenges, raise our heads and say, The Lord is my helper. What can mere mortals do to me? So our sense of security and safety is not from money or any material thing. It is from God. God will never leave nor forsake us. He has the last word, and His word to us is love, is life. Amen? So the question is, would you trust in Jesus during these difficult times, and all of the time, through the good and the bad times? Would you trust in Jesus? Would you invite Him to be the pilot of your life? Would you be emboldened with the courage to think, say, and do what is true and what is love, even in the face of difficulties and challenges? Would you be willing to allow His love and His Spirit to help you live by faith and not just by sight? I hope you do. Lord, help us to know and feel your presence and your present aid. Help us to accept your love and desire for us. Help us to live out in boldness your values. Help us to proclaim you in all we say and do to your honor and to your glory. Amen. I hope to see you next Sunday as I leave you with a praise song uh, from members of our worship team, praise team, and we will hopefully see you next Sunday as we continue together in our journey seeking to know Jesus and to make him known. Amen. God bless and see you next time. Lord of heaven and earth, 
Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, heavens are your tabernacle, glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. Hallelujah to the Lord.